On past programs recently, we have been dealing with a glossary of prophetic terms. And on our last program, we began a study on the rapture and the resurrection. We weren't able to finish it because of time. I'd like to get with that on today's program and then move on to the continuation of our glossary of prophetic terms. We call this Prophecy 101. Gary Stimmer is here to discuss with me this fascinating subject. And we're going to <clears throat> continue talking about the rapture and the resurrection, which really are a single topic in, in one way that we'll go into today. And then uh, following that, we'll look at the second coming of Christ, going right through this alphabetic glossary of terms. After that, we'll look at the tribulation period, the times of the Gentiles, which includes the phrase fullness of the Gentiles. So we have got a lot to talk about today. J.R., we had talked about the rapture, defining pre-mid and post-tribulational rapture. We had talked a little bit about the theory that some may be left behind in the rapture. We don't believe that. We believe that it's the, for all Christians. The partial rapture. The partial rapture. Now, there was a time not too long ago when all who believed in the premillennial second coming of Christ generally believed that the rapture would take place prior to the tribulation period, or more specifically, at the beginning of the tribulation period. And I would say the majority of uh, Bible students still believe that to this day. But there are some who have uh, begun to consider the possibility of a mid-tribulation rapture and uh, post-tribulation rapture. I think the mid-tribbers, uh, if we can call them that, uh, uh, think of it because of the seventh trumpet of Revelation. They think that the last trumpet that the Apostle Paul talked about in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 when he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. That last trump, they said, is the seventh trumpet of Revelation. Well, to me, it is not. And I'd like to briefly explain that. There is an old Jewish story that says that when Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac and God stopped him and gave him a ram, a male lamb, to take Isaac's place, that there, that ram had two horns. And that God took the two horns from that ram and with them made two shofar trumpets. Now I realize this is not in the Bible, but it helps us to understand the Jewish concept, Jewish theology of the first century. The Jews say that God used the first trumpet to blow when he came down to give the law to the people of Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19. The last trumpet, that is the other trumpet on the horn, on the, of the two horns of that ram, will be blown when the dead are raised, that is at the resurrection. So this is the Jewish concept of the first trumpet and the last trumpet. If you'll check the Bible, you'll find out that the first trumpet ever mentioned in the Bible was the one in Exodus chapter 19. And the last trumpet was spoken of by a Jew, a rabbi by the name of Paul. And obviously he would use the Jewish concept. That was the prevailing theory in his day. And I'm not saying that it is not inspired. I believe it is inspired. In fact, I believe that the, that the Jewish thought on the subject was the accurate one. Mm -hmm. That the last trumpet refers to the back to the first trumpet and is not then the seventh trumpet oh. of Revelation. That first trumpet, of course, uh, occurred at the giving of the law, Mount Sinai. Trumpet sounded and it was a day of, of uh, great horror in a way, uh, darkness and clouds and smoke and fire and a warning for the people to keep away from the mountain. Uh, the trumpet that will take the Christians out of this world in a way will be a, a horrifying thing for those who are left, that is the unbelieving world, because it is at that time that judgment will begin. There's another point about the trumpet too, J.R., and that is that when we read about uh, the catching away of the church, and we read in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Uh, it may well be, and some expositors have pointed it out, that the trumpet and the voice are one in the same. Uh, as in Revelation 4, when John is called up to heaven by a voice, mm -hmm. Revelation 4, 1, that uh, after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me. And the trumpet said to him, Come up hither. Mm -hmm. And uh, there we have a trumpet-like voice, and some have suggested that uh, 
that this voice could be the voice of God calling believers to heaven. And it might not be a musical instrument as we think of a trumpet, but it might instead be the voice of God, literally. Now, there are some who believe in a post-tribulation rapture, others in a mid-tribulation rapture. The reason I feel that, um, that uh, we are going to be taken before the tribulation is because the Lord promised to save us from the hour of temptation that would come upon all the world to try men on the earth. And I feel that uh, the tribulation period is uniquely Jacob's trouble. That is, it is a tribulation period designed for the Jew who rejected the um, law of God which said that they must keep the sabbatical years. That was not given to Gentiles. You see, we are no lo nowhere under the Mosaic law. Therefore, we are not bound to it. And so when the Lord gives the, uh, uh, in Leviticus 23, 24, and chapter 25, the uh, story of the sabbatical cycles and how that uh, if the people do not keep the sabbatical years, God is going to send them into captivity and so on. And what we have in the last seven years is the conclusion of that ancient curse of the law. Therefore, you and I are not going to be under that law. We are not Jews. We are Christians, Gentile Christians, not saved by the law, not bound by the law, never have been under the law, never will be under the law. All that was settled in Acts chapter 15 when the council in Jerusalem met to discuss all the Gentiles that were being saved without keeping the works of the law of Moses. And the conclusion was that we should not have to be held accountable for the law of Moses. Therefore, you and I are going to be taken out before Jacob's trouble falls into, uh, into uh, the center stage and begins to be played out upon stage, the drama of this world. You know, the time of Jacob's trouble suggests the life of Jacob. Uh, you have to look back to his life. Mm -hmm. He served Laban for uh, periods of time, measured in weeks, by the way, seven years. And he, uh, after he finally uh, gathered his, his family and fled from Laban's house and fled toward the Promised Land, he, uh, he wrestled all night with an angel before crossing the Jordan into the Promised Land. Mm -hmm. And it was then that his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. And I think that that trouble that he had that night when he wrestled with the angel is a model for the time of Jacob's trouble, which is yet future. And as you say, it is for Israel. It is not for the Gentiles. It's not for the called out body of believers. It's, uh, it's for Israel. And you know, it's very interesting that after Jacob crosses the, uh, the River Jordan, he goes to Sukkot. And then finally he comes to Shalom, which is an ancient name for, I believe, Jerusalem. Yes. And so he enacts not only the time of Jacob's trouble, but the time succeeding, that is the millennial reign of Christ. And so we have here a model then of this terrible period of tribulation. Uh, and the real purpose for the, for the tribulation period is a good purpose, because what it does is bring the people back into uh, r scriptural, religious order under Messiah. Now let's talk about the resurrection. Not only will there be a rapture of those who are alive when Jesus comes, but there will be a resurrection of those who have received Christ as Savior and who have passed away. So the rapture and the resurrection actually is a subject that goes together. Mm -hmm. We call that a blessed hope. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 23, the Bible talks about this resurrection. Every man in his own order Christ the first fruits, and afterward they that are Christ's at His coming. So the resurrection of Jesus was the first fruits of this order of resurrections. And one of these days you and I are going to be placed in that order. We will be resurrected from the dead if we have died by that time, which simply means that the living believers are going to receive the same body that the uh, resurrected believers will receive as we are taken together into heaven 
for seven years while upon the earth the tribulation period transpires. You know, you read uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 23, uh, where it says, afterward, they that are Christ's at His coming. Mm -hmm. And now this doesn't say part of those who are Christ's at His coming, or those who have been good and faithful followers at His coming. It just says, they that are Christ's. Now that would include the whole called out body of believers. So there's a, another scriptural, I believe, proof of the complete rapture of the church. And I like the way the Apostle Paul put it in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and following. He said, Behold, I show you a mystery. This is something that was not understood in the days of the Old Testament. The Apostle Paul is going to explain it. This mystery has been revealed to him by none other than Jesus Christ. He said, we shall not all sleep. That is, not all believers are going to die. There are going to be some people still alive when the Lord returns. And when He comes on that wonderful day of resurrection, there will be those who will be changed. He says, we shall not all sleep. That is, we're not all going to die. But we shall all be changed. That is, whether we are alive or have died and are in the graves, we will all be changed. And he goes on to explain, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. That is, we who are still alive will be changed. He goes on to explain, this corruptible must put on incorruption. That is, the dead body will be raised never to die again. And this mortal must put on immortality. That is, those who are alive when he comes will be changed to never die. So when this corruptible, the dead, shall have put on incorruption, resurrection, and this mortal, the living, shall have put on immortality, the rapture, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? What a blessed hope. And it's blessed in another way. I love the way this is, uh, is explained physically. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Uh, that's the Bible's way of saying n no time at all. Less time than it takes to tell about it. Uh, perhaps a millisecond, just mm -hmm. the tiniest amount of time. And uh, all the pain will be ended. And a new world will open before the eyes of the believer. It's uh, a beautiful promise. Uh, it's, you know, rich men will give up entire fortunes to buy another five years of life when they come to the end of their days. It's just so they might enjoy their riches. But we are promised yes. eternal life, uh, literally in a city of gold and precious stones. And, and this is the great promise. Now let's talk about the second coming of Christ. This would be the next uh, term in our order, in, in alphabetical order. The second coming of Christ. We know He went away, but the promise is that He would return. You recall John chapter 14, he said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. And so uh, our Lord promised that he would come back. This would be his return, or second coming. He came the first time 2,000 years ago. We are now waiting his second coming. When Jesus was raptured from the Mount of Olives in the first opening verses of, in the first chapter of the book of Acts, two men stood by the disciples and promised them that this same Jesus which is taken up from you shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. He's coming back. Gary, there are two phases of his return. Mm -hmm. First would be this rapture and resurrection when mm -hmm. he comes secretly to take us out before the tribulation when he comes for the saints, seven years later when he comes with the saints at the Battle of Armageddon to conquer the armies of the world and to set up his kingdom to rule and reign for a thousand years as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Mm. Yeah. When's he going to return? That's the big question. That's the big question. There are divided uh, opinions about his return. Uh, I believe, J.R., personally, that he'll come at the end of the tribulation period to set up his throne. And to me, it seems very obvious that this is... So that would be a premillennial... Between return. the end of the tribulation and the beginning of the millennium, that is premillennial. There are some, however, who believe in a postmillennial 
second coming of Christ. That is, the Christians, the Christian church is going to establish world utopia and uh, going to win the whole world to Christ. Everybody's going to get saved and then we're going to have a wonderful thousand years of, of utopia because of our faith in Christ. And then after we've got the world where the Lord wants it, he's going to come back and congratulate us for winning the world. That's post tribulation, meaning yeah. he's going to come back after the seventh millennium or after the millennial reign of Christ. This is, um, could not, to me, could not possibly be accurate because the Bible simply says he is going to rule and reign as mm -hmm. king of kings and lord of lords for a thousand years, and I think that's from Jerusalem. Well, you know, this view originated in the fourth century with Augustine, and Augustine's writings, uh, in fact, the book that he wrote was, was called The City of God, and he looked far into the future. And from his reading of Scripture at that time, it seemed apparent to him that the church would subdue the earth mm -hmm. and the gospel would be preached around the world. And at that time, the world would, would enter into a, an era of peace. And uh, the church would mediate that peace. That is, uh, uh, from, from, the, uh, from the mother church, if you will, all around the world, peace would emanate. And to him, that was a perfectly acceptable vision. Well, well, you know, the dreaded Roman government had become Christianized in his day. Constantine right. had made Christianity the government religion. That's right. And so, boy, Christianity had conquered the world. Sure. <laughs> and, and the kingdom had arrived, but Jesus hadn't. And so they had to come up with some idea, some reason why the kingdom had come and Christ had not. And so there arose the post-millennial theory. J.R., I think in our day, it's easy to see that the writings of Paul, which uh, prophesied of, of tribulation, uh, in the last days wrote Paul to, in 2 Timothy, uh, perilous times shall come. And Paul seemed to indicate that it, in the end days, there would be a social, uh, political, uh, monetary breakdown. Things would get pretty chaotic. And it appears to me that's the way we're heading right now. Then there is that amillennial theory. The amillennial says no millennium. Someday Christ will come, raise the dead, judge the sinners, give uh, saints will go to heaven, sinners will go to hell. Poof, that's it. Eternity begins. No seventh millennium. Mm. Well, I had one man in, in uh, San Antonio, a minister, to say, tell me that he used to be a premillennial, but now he was amillennial, because this statement in uh, Revelation where Jesus would rule, six times it says it, that he will rule for a thousand years, mm -hmm. was just um, ethereal. It, it was not uh, locked in. It was just sort of a way of saying, uh, like the 70 times 7 mm -hmm. doesn't really mean 490 mm -hmm. times. Figure of speech. It's a figure of speech. It's just, it's just got to be from now on, you see. It's a kingdom that will have no end. Uh, uh, therefore, there is no millennium. And of course, that kind of person accepts the idea that uh, we've been here longer than 6,000 years. You know, that's the kind of guy who can say, well, Jericho goes back 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. And this, this, um, this helps, um, shall we say, a more liberal type of view of the Bible um, with the idea that man's been here maybe, mm -hmm. oh, million years, maybe a couple million <laughs> years, you know, and at least 20, 30, 40,000. That gets rid of that idea of 6,000 years of human history and the yeah. seventh millennium being right. the great Sabbath rest. Therefore, those who believe that have to come up with some kind of an amillennial idea of the end of time. If but, we've been here for 40, 50,000 years, Gary, yeah. when's it going to end? Exactly, <laughs> yeah. In, in, all, in other words, God is no longer in control of the clock in, yeah. that, in that case. Uh, but I think he is in control of the clock, as a matter of fact. And Absolutely. In, in Revelation 19 and 20, we have uh, uh, a picture. Christ comes back, the armies of heaven, uh, the saints clothed in white linen come with him. And in Revelation 20, uh, verse 4, we have them ruling and reigning with him for a thousand years. Now, that's plain English. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can't mistake that. There it is, a thousand yep. years. Yep, that's right.
Now we've talked about the second coming, the millennium, and we've talked about the tribulation period, its duration being seven years. Daniel 9, 27 talks about the week or the Shavuot, the seven-year cycle. Ezekiel 39, 9 says the battle of Gog and Magog will last for just a short time, and then the cleanup, the burning of the weapons, will last for seven years, Ezekiel 39, 9. And to me, that generally speaks of the tribulation period being seven years long. The Great yes. Tribulation, uh, theologians have considered to be the last half of the tribulation period. Indeed. The last three and a half years. This is Jacob's trouble, says Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Mm -hmm. Now let's move quickly to the times of the Gentiles, for time is of the essence. Mm, it is indeed. Times of the Gentiles, Luke 21, 24, Jesus said, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. These times of the Gentiles refers to Gentile dominion over Jerusalem. And it began with Nebuchadnezzar. Now, I think that's very uh, easy to understand from the prophecies of Daniel. I think so, too. And by the way, the times of the Gentiles... Uh, begin with Babylon. And the, in mm -hmm. another way, they end with Babylon, because when you come to the destruction of Mystery Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18, that cuts, every, that cuts off Babylon. Mm -hmm. So the times the Gentiles are sort of centered around the spiritual, uh, uh, this hideous spiritual mystery known as Mystery Babylon. I would like to explain something here from Romans 11:25. The Apostle Paul talks about the fullness of the Gentiles, and some Christians have a tendency to confuse the two. The fullness of the Gentiles, does that mean the end of the times of the Gentiles? Listen to the way Paul put it in Romans 11:25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now the context of Romans 11 deals with Gentile converts to Christ. So these, this fullness of the Gentile means, uh, refers to the idea that the last Gentile is going to be born again. This, this refers to the gospel going to the Gentiles has nothing to do with Gentile domination of Jerusalem. This is two separate subjects, don't get them confused. Mm. You know, the fullness of the Gentiles also means something else, J.R. It means that the called out body of believers is complete. Mm -hmm. Starting in Pentecost, moving until the end of that calling, that is the end of the church age, I think marks the fullness of the Gentiles. <laughs> All is not lost. Jesus is coming soon. This is J.R. Church and Gary Sturman. Until next time, keep looking up. <laughs>